2. The Whirlwind to See Colonel Slavsky. Below the Castle, Hagman, June 19th. In the event, nobody came. It was two weeks before the advance PKs reported that the Pagman force, wearing the green caps of the Eagle's unit, Geardbad, the Whirlwind, were approaching the Tapa Castle in some strength. It was just after first light on a perfect June day. When the Russians had first entered the valley, the resistance fighters had stopped them, shooting down five helicopters and destroying several tanks and APCs in what was known to the Mujahideen as the First Battle of Pagman in July 1981, and the Soviet troops had withdrawn. Now the bandits were actually coming straight at the fortification. They could not hope to take it, of course, Slavsky thought, though in addition to rifles they were seen to be carrying what might be Russian dashkas, heavy machine guns which had been captured or handed over by Afghan deserters from the Red Regime. These were the weapons which were, at last, bringing down the helicopters, sometimes with only a short burst of fire. They were the great prize, when they could be removed from immobilised armoured fighting vehicles and carried off. Slavsky ordered the aircraft to stay on the ground. We'll not need air support for this one, he told Strike Liaison briefly. We'll show the scum what ordinary guns can do. Here was a chance for a little hunting in armchair comfort. He missed the regular slaying of bears and boars, that he and his fellow officers used to enjoy in the Russian forests at this time of the year. A little blood out here might make up for his deprivation. One of his Central Asian officers was on forward observation. A Mongolian with a sense of the dramatic, he was delighted that the guerrillas were coming out at last. He should come through over the air at any moment now. The radio in Slavsky's room crackled. Forward observation to Commander Kunkur, blood drinker here. That barbarian would insist on using, as his code name, some dreadful native word. All messages had to be in standard and authorised terminology, but unfortunately for security reasons, local call signals could be left to private enterprise. Commandant to blood drinker, come in then. Blood drinker reporting, 200 to 250 terrorists advancing towards killing ground. Lightly armed, parties of 10 to 12, no good targets yet. Now approaching at 1,750 metres. Heard and understood, blood drinker, commandant off. Slavsky turned to his radio operator. I'm going to the command post now. The man followed him up the steps to the turret of the castle, stuffing a piece of mold-proof black bread into his pocket. He had developed a taste for Afghan-style bread during Nanpaz's time, but alas, it was now back to army tack. There was an armchair in the turret, and Colonel Slavsky settled himself in it. What a view! You could see almost the whole valley. The chair idea was copied from a film he had seen, shown for briefing purposes only, of course, an American production. It had shown a tough Yankee commander in Vietnam directing operations from just such a perch as this. And he had been attended by his faithful radio operator as well, just like Slavsky. The radio squawked. Blood drinker was coming in again. Slavsky guessed, by the interference, that other units, hearing that something was happening in his sector, were breaking into the artillery communications network to eavesdrop. Well, he'd show them how things were done. Let them listen. Yes, it was the forward observation post. Blood drinker to commander. Attention, badmashes, villains, closing, advancing under natural cover, range a thousand metres and moving. The radio operator was gesturing to him that someone else was trying to get through. Slavsky acknowledged Blood Drinker and looked inquiringly at him. General Zaitsev asking to come in on our frequency, sir. 
Zaitsev, that comedian. The old drunk would not keep out of anything, would he? Promoted far beyond his competence just because people were saying that air support was the coming thing. Put the general on, signaler. Zaitsev to Slavsky, are you there, comrade colonel? Listening, comrade general. I've noticed that you have a little game going on over there in your castle, eh? That's right, and comrade general, I am in the middle of dealing with some bandits, if you don't mind. That's just what I want to talk about. They seem to have got very close to you, and perhaps you need ground attack by aviation. Stumovye Destivia Aviatsi, SDA, which I control. You know about it, of course. Of course, Slavsky knew about it. He even knew the relevant passage from the textbook by heart. SDA, attack by air from minimum distance against visible targets, using various destruction methods and means. Comrade General, I know all about it, and I have already declined air support. I can easily deal with this rabble, and we are under orders not to waste supplies, as you perhaps know. Comrade Colonel, I understand completely. It was just that I hoped nothing had slipped your memory. Insolent fool. Still. Thank you, Comrade General. I am returning to my attack situation. Slavsky out. Time to speak to the people who would actually engage the enemy, the mortar unit. Commander to Pervy Echelon, first echelon. Here now. Object of imminent engagement is neutralization of enemy. Situation estimate already made. Prepare for operational orders. This was going to be a copybook exercise, just like those which he had studied again and again during his three years at the Frunze Military Academy. Mortar control was coming through clearly, terminology very correct. Mortar control responding. Mortar control reporting. Mortar control to commander. First echelon mortars deployed in maximum density and listening. Good. The colonel had worked out a plan for just such a situation as this, dealing with a terrorist attempted assault on a DFS, permanent fortified structure. The mortar subunit of his motorized rifle regiment was already drilled, in impeccable military phraseology, for such a situation taken direct from the book, Organization of Fire. Time for the next step. Commander to mortar control. Confirm readiness for automatic or barrage fire. Slavsky had set up the system himself, the latest in electronic linked and synchronized fire, so that the whole augmented battery of 40 weapons could fire simultaneously. From the book, of course. Mortar control to commander. Confirming mortar battery ready for concentrated fire, barrage or automatic. Now the spotter, blood drinker, was coming in again through the artillery network. Commander from blood drinker. The enemy is now at 750 meters and closing. Shall I fall back to prepared defensive position, query? Hear and respond. That was blood drinker to commander. All was at combat readiness. There was no need for the forward observer now. Slavsky answered, Commander to blood drinker, affirmative, fall back, fall back. Do not engage the enemy. I am taking command initiative. Blood drinker to commander, heard and understood. Transmission ends. Slavsky turned to the radio operator. Combat alert, the message went out. The klaxons sounded and the non-combatant troops clustered around the forty mortars. That was a good sign, showed that the men were keen, Slavsky thought, as the loudspeakers echoed through every corner of the castle. Combat alert! Combat alert! Then, attacker! 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 Attack coming! This is a combat alert! The advancing men on the plain below him were clearly visible through Slavsky's field glasses now. Artillery watch, attention. This is the commander. Take over spotting of approaching bandits and confirm. Artillery watch to commander. Message heard and understood. Enemy in our glasses. 
Estimate numbers 250 men. Lightly armed parties of 10 men each, closing in now at 500 meters. Commander to artillery watch, understood, continue observation. Slavsky was going to let the Mujahideen get as near as possible to minimum mortar range. Then he was going to butcher them. Every mortar linked, each firing at once at precisely the same moment. If the Afghans didn't break up their groups and go into individual attack formation very soon now, they would be annihilated. Now to get the range to the last millimetre. Commander to artillery watch. Take range and bearing from plan position indicator and supply to mortars. Artillery watch to commander, taking range and bearing for supply to mortars from Indicata Krugovuga Obzora. Commander to mortar firing central. Mortar firing central listening. Take range and bearing of target. Mortar firing central understood. Commander to mortar firing continues message. Mortar firing central listening. Commander to mortar firing. Slavsky almost rubbed his hands together. This was the life. Precise firing procedure will be followed. Mortar firing central acknowledges. Fire procedure will be followed. Colonel Slavsky took up his glasses again to have a look at his opponents. He could see them very clearly now. So these were the famous whirlwind warriors. They picked fancy names like that, he thought, because they were such a hopeless rabble like children playing at Indian chiefs, like beggars imagining that they were kings. The eagle looked around to see that his men were correctly deployed and beckoned to his second-in-command, Kassab the Butcher, a useful man. Of course, he was used to blood, but he had also passed the guerrilla battle course in thirty days instead of two months. He had shown distinct commandability too. Kassab, they haven't fired a shot. They're either calling in air support, helicopters, or they're holding their fire until we get closer. Which do you think it is? Holding fire? Maybe they're afraid of the dashkas we've got set up. Helicopters don't like heavy machine guns. Anyway, why should they fire until we get really close, so long as we are still advancing? Right, I think so too. So far, so good. What do you mean, Eagle? We'll never kill anyone in the castle from the ground with rifles. They're safe in there, and we are very exposed out here. I'd have liked some information, or orders more specific than follow my flag signals. Security, Kassab. Perhaps you talk in your sleep. Ever thought of that? The butcher was the butt of all the whirlwind men since he had formed the habit of falling asleep when he was a reserve during firefights, though he would wake up, completely alert in a split second, if called upon. Firing never bothered him. It was the strangest thing, thought his commander. The butcher said nothing. In the castle, the robotic procedures were grinding on. Mortar control, this is the commander. Acknowledge my signal. Good. Stand by to fire when sighting completed. Firing to start when the enemy reaches 100 meters and not before. I repeat, 100 meters. Ignore any enemy fire. Keep behind parapets. Confirm if understood. Mortar control to commander. Understood. Commander to mortar control. Once mortars are sighted at minimum range, aim at bandit groups when they reach 100 meters. Each double mortar position to take one bandit group, starting from left. Leftmost bandit group will be for mortars one and two. Complete this ranging and report. After a few moments, mortar control confirmed the arrangement. Commander confirming that mortars shall not fire at random and that all fire is electronically synchronized. Mortar control to confirm. Mortar control confirms for commander. Commander confirms instructions. 100 meters. The checklist litany droned on. Finally, fire will be continuous at 25 rounds per minute until countermanded. 
the mortar control operator confirmed. Commander to mortar firing, stand by to fire, keep radio channel crystal stable 444 open. Standing by, channel open. Crouching behind his boulder, the eagle spoke to the butcher. We're nearly at their mortar's minimum effective distance, Kasab. This is more than the killing ground. It's like the total liquidation ground. Nichevo, no matter, eagle. Right. We're at 150 meters now. Signal orange flag to our whole battle group for increased pace of advance. They've seen it, eagle. Battle group advancing. The eagle felt the sweat running down the back of his neck, like a man would in a steam bath. A good commander does not expose himself unnecessarily, it had said in the field manual which he had been studying. But this was going to be a gift. He had to test himself to have been there right in front. Certainly the men expected it. Afghans had never shown an inclination to be led from the rear. There were only a hundred metres to go now. If they went any nearer to the castle, the mortars or machine guns would certainly fire since at closer range their mortars would be less accurate. Kasab, we are now 100 meters from the target. This is the minimum effective distance for Russian M37 mortars. Raise the green flag. Green flag up, to signal, prepare for battle. The Mujahideen Combat Group signalers have acknowledged. The snouts of the 82mm mortars, their barrels almost vertical, were clearly visible to the guerrillas. They could imagine the Russian mortar men bent over their sights, the 33 kilogram rounds ready to drop in. Each one of the 250 raiders had stopped. All were unwinding their sashes. In the castle's command post, the radio was screeching. Artillery watch to commander. Bandits have stopped at 100 meters. Slavsky was glad. He had been on the verge of ordering fire at the moving men before their impetus brought them too close. Commander responds, you can sign off now, artillery watch. What was that they were doing? Comrade Colonel, the radio operator was excited. They're making turbans of their white shrouds, wrapping them around their green caps. This is a suicide attack. Damn barbarians. That's what they are, even off. Their religion, you know. What an ideology. They think they'll go to paradise just for being killed by us. Still, the cold menace of the thing made him feel uneasy. Surely there could not really be people with no fear of death. The guerrillas must be kept still at all costs now, the eagle thought. Blue flag up, Kasab. Blue flag up, eagle, for battle group stand firm. Seeing the flag, the baker said to himself, I hope my hands are shaking only because of the desire to kill. But I don't know. I'm only a beginner at this sort of thing. I'll have to remember to ask Commandant Eagle when we get back to the caves. In the command post, all was in order. Slavsky intoned, Commander to mortar control, stand by for firing. Mortar control to commander, standing by. This was going to be as easy as any exercise, probably easier. Those guerrillas were crazy, waiting to be killed. They'd be done before lunchtime. Colonel Slavsky was sure that he'd enjoy his meal. Some of those excellent kalbasa, pink Moscow sausages, had arrived, and he liked them very much. He reached for the microphone. Here goes. Commander to mortar control. I shall now count down to firing signal. Fire synchronizing buttons at the count of one. Now countdown begins. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one. There was always a thrill in giving the actual firing order to the artillery oneself. 
The forty mortars, all sighted on their targets, unmissable, static targets. Two mortars with their high explosive shells due to hit each guerrilla combat group, fired. With a combined roar and a surge of flame from two score weapons, with rock and steel flying in all directions, the bombs, doctored by the eagle's skill to fire prematurely, exploded in the mortar tubes, blowing the guns, their crews, and the spectators crowded around them indiscriminately to smithereens. For at least a hundred men it suddenly seemed, and almost instantly was, the end of the world. From the turret high above the mortars, Commandant Colonel Slavsky saw the carnage among his men, and stared in disbelief at the whooping Mujahideen below, less than a hundred yards from the castle walls. He struggled to his feet from the cushioned armchair, only to fall back into it, neatly picked off by an expert guerrilla sniper, Maher Tirandaz, as the men of the whirlwind withdrew under covering fire. To the side of the castle, a second explosion and a column of smoke showed the eagle's observers that the mine placed at the weakest point of the wall had done its work. For the men in the castle, shocked and confused, trying to organize first aid, this sound, and even the smoke, made little impact. As the wall was breached, the second attack unit of the whirlwind hurled themselves into the fortress through the dust, fumes, falling rocks, spraying the few defenders at point-blank range with Kalashnikov rapid fire, killing most of them and driving the rest into headlong flight. In the deep underground ice chambers, the prisoners, suspects and captives intended for deportation as hostages to Russia were found crouching in the far corners of their huge communal cells, as they had been warned to do by the Eagle's message the night before. None was injured. Within ten minutes, the entire group of captives, some fifty people, was scrambling up a rock face, guided by the Mujahideen who had been trained for this phase of the operation. Both the hostages and the whirlwind attack force had reached safety before, at last, the helicopters came overhead. Not a scratch on anyone, said the Eagle as they celebrated their victory. It was as good as one of those raids right into Kabul city the time we blew up the gas tanks and got clean away. If you remember, not only did we not lose anyone, but several people joined us right off the streets. He hugely enjoyed telling his men, most of whom had been kept in ignorance for security's sake, how he and a small group, instructed by Captain Azambai, had doctored the mortar shells in the parked truck and simply left them for the Russians to collect. If the Nikolais had been eating my bread instead of that unhealthy baked brown leather of theirs, their brains would not have been so addled as to fall for your ruse, tampering with the mortar bomb fuses. Anyway, that kind of fiddling can be dangerous. We could all have been blown up. The baker grinned. The eagle laughed. Nanbaz, you are a better baker than you are a linguist. You didn't know, did you, that the Russian word miney means mortar bomb as well as mine. It means that, though we didn't get any mines, we did get, thanks to you, the little amusement we've just had. Thank you, Eagle. The baker had had his recognition at last. After all, they do say a ruse is worth a tribe. Long live the revolution, said the butcher. Shame on the killers, said the baker. Hurrah for victory, said the eagle. After the baker had had his share of glory, the eagle let the Mujahideen into the secret he had held back thus far. They cheered Captain Azambai to the echo when they discovered that it was his radio which had eavesdropped on the castle's special frequency, revealing that all the mortars had been linked electronically to fire at the same time. They insisted on Captain Azambai teaching them the word for it, which they sometimes called him by as a title, Radio Voina, Electronic Warfare.